I invite you to, to follow the next presentation if you want, because Professor Ken Berridge is already here. And it is the talk of the evening. Uh, is the uh, I have this honor to introduce him. Um, for who doesn't know, this Ken Berridge is working as a professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's a winner of uh, Grey Mayor Award in psychology in 2018. Um, probably the most uh, 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 productive scholar I encountered in my life. Uh, and it's the most important uh, figure in psychology and neuropsychology, in neuroscience in the world, sorry. Um, He's here tonight to talk about uh, uh, things that uh, probably we are we are all studying in uh, uh, um, in the school in, in in our masters. So, uh, but what uh, uh, we can uh, say for sure is that um, in his laboratory, uh, his main focus was on. Uh, um, how the pleasure is generated in the brain, what causes addiction, and can be can uh, emotion ever to ever be truly unconscious. So his talk today will be about uh, addiction and pleasure, bringing to our attention his expertise and years of research in these topics. So, Professor Kenderich, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Florin. You were far too kind to me in that introduction. I hope you're all enjoying a great conference so far, and I'm really glad to be able to join you in this way. Um, I'd like to talk about brain, what we know about brain mechanisms of pleasure and desire today and what the implications that that has for understanding addictions and some related disorders. Let me first try to share my screen. Is it working, the sharing? Yes. Okay, great, super. So we'll talk about the brain reward system, but I think we can kind of divide the brain reward system into structures that actually generate true pleasure liking and other structures which are much more robust that do not generate pleasure, but do generate wanting for pleasant rewards. And so here in this diagram, the green is this massive wanting system, sort of centered on dopamine, mesolimbic dopamine projections to nucleus accumbens, but with many other structures too, a massive wanting system. Um, and a very small, nestled within it, a very small set of hedonic hotspots, which can generate true pleasure liking. These are pleasure generators, and we'll talk about the relation of them. Um, I'd like to give you a little sense of the, of the roles of liking versus wanting in addiction, especially as the incentive sensitization hypothesis of addiction views addiction. Then I'd like to give you some new evidence coming from the lab that's perhaps our strongest proof of principle demonstration of a central postulate of the incentive sensitization theory, which is that wanting can detach from liking sometimes in addiction. It's possible to want much more than a target is liked. It's even possible to want something that's not liked at all, want to want what hurts you. And that's um, a demonstration I'll show you from the Animal Neuroscience Laboratory. And then last, we'll consider some clinical applications to human addictions and related disorders. So that's the topic for today. Maybe I should begin by saying that my lab, we can study, we do animal experiments with rodents. So mostly we can study sensory pleasures like drugs, cocaine and opioids or food pleasures, sweet tastes and such. Um, but the implications, the conclusions we can learn about sensory pleasures may apply far beyond sensory pleasures to human cultural and cognitive pleasures too. Um, in the last 20 years, human neuroimaging evidence, I think, has suggested that the same brain systems that evolve for sensory pleasure are recruited for all kinds of cognitive and cultural human pleasures. So in human addicts who are looking at videos of, of either sexual scenes or drug shooting up scenes, the same brain systems light up to drugs and to sex in, as incentives. Um, Anna Rose Childress and colleagues have shown. Um, even something as cognitive and human as music, uh, a McGill study 
of music students at McGill University in Canada who asked music students to pick their very favorite music that they listen to that gives them chills of pleasure. And as they listen to it, it lights up brain systems like the nucleus accumbens, the mesolimbic dopamine target, um, not just cortical systems, but the mesolimbic nucleus accumbens that evolve for sensory pleasures. And even something as abstract and human as a general sense of well-being, of hedonic well-being, may correlate to nucleus accumbens, subcortical mesolimbic activations. This is a study by Richie Davidson and colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, who asked older adults to rate how satisfied they are with their life, how happy they are in life. And surprisingly to me, there is a correlation between how happy they are and nucleus accumbens activity, sustained activity in the nucleus accumbens. What this suggests is that what we can learn about sensory pleasures may also apply to wider human pleasures because the same brain systems are mediating both. To the extent that's true, the conclusions I can give you today will apply far beyond just the animal experiments. The basic thesis that my lab has worked with for a number of years now is that reward can be divided into psychological components that map somewhat well onto brain systems. So there's, rewards are things we like, we want the things we like, um, and most things we want and like in life have been learned about. In human life, we've learned about the rewards we seek. So these are the three components, but we'll focus today on wanting the large system and liking to kind of tease them apart. Regarding addiction, this, this separation of liking and wanting, it may help to understand why some individuals and only some individuals become addicted. Um, it, even in the United States, in recent studies, 80% of adults have taken an addictive drug at some time in their life, if we conclude alcohol and nicotine, yet very few become addicts in proportion to that large number. Um, even for illegal drugs of abuse, only 10 to 20% of those who are taking them typically become addicts in a persisting compulsive way that lasts for decades if they're taking opiates, opioids, cocaine, psychostimulants. 16% of people who use cocaine in their teens and 20s are using heavily and addicted 10 years later, but only 16%. And even for those who are taking cocaine intravenously, only 30% become compulsively addicted. 30%, another 30% become just casual users, but they can take it or leave it, and 30% give it up entirely. So the question is, what's happening in those who do become addicted? What's different? It's not just the drug impact, what's happening in the brains of those that become addicted that makes them compulsively addicted? That's the question for addiction neuroscience. That's what we seek to answer. And it's probably fair to say that in addiction neuroscience, there are several different major theories today that you're probably familiar with. Um, the traditional one going back many decades is the notion that people take drugs to for drug pleasure and to escape distress, distress of withdrawal, to escape distress of other life events that are distressing. Um, it's very, very plausible and intuitive, but is, of course, it's very well known that people who are addicted can go into detox centers, go through withdrawal, come out of withdrawal, and yet still be vulnerable to relapse weeks, months, years later. The addiction doesn't go away with withdrawal distress. Addiction can happen in the absence of any distress, the compulsive urge to take again. So other theories try to address this. Why can addiction persist beyond distress and pleasure? Um, there are learning theories of addiction, especially uh, highlighted at Cambridge University by um, Barry Everett and Trevor Robbins, drawing on the notion that addiction is basically an overly learned habit, a must-do habit. Um, this taps into some predictionary theories of dopamine function, the notion that dopamine is a learning and teaching system um, that one can gain exaggerated prediction errors, exaggerated expectations of drugs. And there are related cognitive dysfunction models focusing on shrinkage of the cortical prefrontal lobes or at least dysfunction um, hypoactivity of the cortical prefrontal lobes that may imply a loss of top-down control over strong habits or strong urges. 
The last theory is the incentive sensitization theory. And this says that it isn't necessary to be in withdrawal or distress. It isn't even necessary to have wrong expectations about how good a drug is going to be or how well life will be after we take the drug. It's possible for an addict to be absolutely accurate and know and predict accurately that the drug will be only so good they might like it or they might not like this particular drug and it might they might predict it will destroy their life but they still fi find the urge compulsive this notion says that it's wanting the mesolimbic wanting system that in some individuals can create very strong wants to take the drug that far exceed the liking for the drug and that don't require wrong expectations it hinges on really two notions this theory. The first is that there is a separation between liking and wanting in the brain, that this large green wanting system centered on mesolimbic dopamine is not mediating pleasure liking of drugs or any other pleasure event, but instead mediating wanting. We first proposed that notion in the 1990s, and I think it's fair to say it was based on our animal studies of taste reactivity to suggest that if we change dopamine, it didn't change liking, facial liking reactions to tastes like sugar, but it did change the wanting of those rewards. I think it's fair, though, to say that nobody believed us for at least 10 years in the field. And it really wasn't until the mid-2000s that studies in humans began to find similar evidence. So here's an example to look at a human study. This was done by Marco Layton at McGill University in Montreal in Canada. He gave people cocaine. And he asked them how much they wanted to take some more cocaine. And he asked them how much they, they liked the cocaine, how euphoric and pleasant it was. And then in some people, he also depleted brain dopamine simultaneously while they were taking cocaine. He either gave them dopamine antagonist drugs together with the cocaine, or he gave them, asked them to drink a an amino acid milkshake uh, that, that was designed to temporarily impede the synthesis of dopamine in their brains for the next few hours. So it would reduce dopamine synthesis. The question was, what would reducing dopamine do to liking cocaine ratings? And what would it do to wanting cocaine ratings? Would it suppress both? The answer was no, it doesn't suppress both. So let's look at this here. The black line here is cocaine alone, just cocaine. And a person, and if we're seeing higher and higher doses as we go along the x-axis. So the more cocaine a person takes, the higher the dose, the more they want to take another dose of cocaine. It's the nature of cocaine. It takes some, you want to take more. And also, reasonably, the black line, the, this is the liking pleasant euphoria ratings. The more cocaine they took, the higher the dose, the more they liked the cocaine. So now the question is, if we suppress dopamine, what does that do? The red line is the suppression of dopamine. So we can see that what it is doing, if we take dopamine suppression, it reduces the wanting to take more cocaine, even at the higher doses, it reduces the wanting to take more, but it doesn't actually really reduce the liking ratings of cocaine. They still like the cocaine as much, but they don't want to take it as much as they did without the dopamine suppression. This kind of evidence began to make people think, okay, well, maybe yes, dopamine is more about wanting than liking. If wanting is suppressed, but euphoria liking stays high, that's the nature of dopamine. That's one fact that plays into incentive sensitization. The second main fact is that dopamine systems in the brain, in some individuals, when they take drugs again and again, they don't just show tolerance and receptor downregulation that all individuals show, but some individuals additionally show neural sensitization of their brain dopamine systems. Um, to be sensitized means to respond more powerfully the next time the drug is taken. This happens especially if drugs are taken in binges, separated by periods. So say taking on the weekend in a binge, but not during the weekdays, spacing the binges and taking them at high doses. It doesn't happen in everyone. It only happens in some individuals who are especially susceptible or vulnerable. It's influenced strongly by genes. It's influenced by prior stressful experiences. It's influenced by other things like sex hormones and such. Um, is There's massive individual differences in sensitization vulnerability among rats and also among individual humans. Individuals differ. Another thing about sensitization is that when it happens, 
if it happens in an individual, if a person then stops taking the drug, things like tolerance and withdrawal eventually go away in days or weeks if we stop taking a drug. But sensitization doesn't go away even if we stop taking a drug for weeks. Instead, if anything, it can grow stronger. This is sometimes called incubation of craving, the growth of craving urges over a month or so of not taking a drug. And the last thing about sensitization is if it happens, it not only grows over the month of drug abstinence, but it may last perhaps permanently. It lasts at least half a lifetime of a rat. It may well laugh, last half a lifetime of a person. So this is the notion of incentive sensitization, the, the theory. And what it implies is that if an individual was sensitizing their mesolimbic dopamine systems as they took drugs again and again, they could come to want that drug more and more, even if they liked it the same, or even if they liked it less, even if they developed tolerance to the liking, they'd still want it more, independent of withdrawal, independent of expectations. Sensitization can be caused by many different kinds of drugs, uh, cocaine and amphetamine and other psychostimulants, opioids, heroin and fentanyl and other opioids, um, alcohol, nicotine can cause sensitization, many drugs of abuse. Um, interacting with dopamine brain systems and glutamate signaling within those systems to potentiate this. That's the theory, but it's probably fair to say to ask, is it really possible to want something much more than we like it? Is it really possible for wanting to truly detach from liking of the same target? And that's where some new evidence comes into play, because we've been wanting in our lab to get control of this wanting process. And in addiction neuroscience, I think we now pretty well have a number of ways to change the intensity of wanting by manipulating mesolimbic systems. But what we do not understand in addiction neuroscience, I think, yet is what controls the focus of wanting, the target, the particular target, the direction, and the width or narrowness of the focus. You and I in daily life, we want different things at different moments. When we're hungry, we want, we want to eat. When we're thirsty, we'd like a drink. At other moments, we'd like, we want something else. The focus of wants changes. In addiction, one thing may become more enduringly wanted and wanted above others. What's controlling this focus and persistence? That's why we're now recently recruiting the mesolimbic system, but not necessarily turning on the dopamine system directly, rather turning on amygdala systems that may focus through learning, focus motivation on particular targets. We're using optogenetic stimulation in the amygdala, central nucleus of amygdala, and we compare that laser activation of amygdala neurons with sugar or cocaine or pain, and you'll see what happens here. We're using the amygdala in order to recruit this entire mesolimbic system, but in order to focus it on a one learned target and make that sort of an addictive pursuit of the one learned target. The amygdala is able to recruit the mesolimbic dopamine system to create urges that are focused in this way, as you'll see. Um, it's basically done, I'm sure most of you are familiar with optogenetics, but basically it's been done by in putting a micro injection, a tiny droplet of a virus into the rat's amygdala on both sides. The virus contains a gene for channel rhodopsin. It's an opsin, like in our eyes, there are opsins. Opsin molecules, if light strikes them, the molecule changes shape and can open sodium gates or other ion gates. Channel rhodopsin will do that if light strikes it. The droplet of virus in the amygdala cannot spread outside the amygdala, the virus can't spread, but it can infect the amygdala neurons and those neurons will start to sprout photoreceptor molecules, the, the channel rhodopsin molecules, then blue laser light can activate them and make the neurons fire. This is what the rats look like in the situation. It's a painless head cap. These are the optic fibers that are going into their amygdala, but we can then connect them up. What does it do psychologically? Well, let's see, this is a case of a rat who has a chance to avoid a, a nasty event, a painful event. This is a shock rod in this chamber and the rat does not have to touch it. If the rat voluntarily touches it, it'll get an electric shock from this rod, but it doesn't have to touch. A normal rat will touch once or twice and then stay as far away as possible. And 
show an anti-predator behavior, um, such as this ground squirrel, this mother ground squirrel here in California mountains is showing to this rattlesnake who's approaching her burrow. The rattlesnake wants to get into the burrow to eat the pups, the newborn pups of the mother. And the mother is kicking sand in the rattlesnake's face. It's an anti-predator behavior. Rats will do this to a shock prod and they can actually bury the shock prod, defensive burying. Let's see a normal rat. And also let's see a rat who has channel rhodopsin laser activation of the amygdala paired whenever the rat gets within a centimeter of this rod, this laser comes on. Let's see the two rats here. First, a normal rat. This is a normal rat. Here's the shock rod. Got a shock. It's one more. It was curious, but now it stays as far away as possible. She's against the far wall, wall and she's kicking sand towards the rod. Here's a laser rat with the amygdala activation. He, she gets a shock, but she comes back to the rod. She's fascinated by this rod and is nibbling on its base. That shocked her. And she is hovering over it seemingly fascinated, gets another shock on her paw, she can get another and another. Rats will get in a 20 minute session, they will shock themselves 10 times, 15 times, sometimes 20 times, if, then we take them out if they shock themselves 20 times, but who knows how high they would go. This is a incentive motivation attraction that pulls the rats to the rod. If we say to the rats, well, we'll make you safe, it's not a defensive reaction attacking the rod. If we say, we'll, we'll make you safe, we'll put you on this other side of the safety barrier so you don't have to even see this rod unless you stand up on your hind legs, you're safe. Will the rat climb over it to reach the rod? If the rat does climb over it, we'll bring it gently back and replace it again if it gets a shock on that side. This is what happens. These laser rats will cross in a 15 minute session, they'll cross five to 10 times. And every time they cross, they get shocks. We'll bring them back safely and they cross again. We bring them back safely. They're actively seeking out this rod that shocks them. Is it that they're seeking laser? Is that what they seek? And they're willing to pay a price of shock? I don't think so because if we use a dummy rod, an identical rod, but it doesn't give a shock, it's disconnected, and we pair laser with the dummy rod, the rats are not attracted to the dummy rod. It's not the laser itself they seek, it's the laser's transformation of the perception and evaluation of this shock rod that shocked them. Why is that happening? What's happening in their brain that makes that possible? Well, at the moment, these rats are attracted to the rod. What lights up in their brain isn't, isn't just the amygdala that we're stimulating, it's also the entire mesolimbic system. This is a map of FOS activation. The CFOS gene transcribes into FOS protein, a, a metabolic step that neurons, when they're metabolically activated, engage in this early immediate gene. And it's activated in the dopamine neurons of the ventral tegmentum and the substantia nigra. It's activated in the targets of the dopamine neurons in the nucleus accumbens and in the orbital frontal cortex and insula. It's a reward system mediating attraction to the rod, the shock rod. It's not that the rats want laser, we've said, because they're not attracted to the dummy rod very much. And if we ask them, well, we'll, we'll throw away all, all rods. Let's just say you can touch this other little water spout here and you'll get laser, touch this other spout, you'll get nothing, no shocks, no ro shock rods. Will the rats self-stimulate? One or two rats does self-stimulate, but most of them hardly at all, and some not at all, but all of them were attracted to the shock rod when the laser was paired with the shock rod. So it's transforming that specially. It's not just adding a laser value. This is wanting something that has no liking at all, wanting what hurts you. But of course, real addictions, they're things we both, we do like at least to begin with. So what happens things like cocaine, things like perhaps sugar to those who believe in sugar addictions or food addictions. What happens if we put the laser on something like cocaine or sugar? Here's a rat who has a choice. She can earn painless interfusions, painless intravenous infusions of cocaine by poking her nose in this hole, or she can earn, and if she earns that, she'll also get laser paired with the cocaine. If she pokes in this hole, she'll get sugar pellets, sucrose pellets, and no laser. That's for that group of rats. We'll take a second group of rats, give them the same identical choice, except for these rats, the laser is paired with the sugar pellet. When she pokes in this hole, they get sugar pellets plus laser. If they poke in this hole, they get intravenous cocaine, but no laser. 
what's it like in the situation? Well, here's a clip of the rats doing it. They have uh, intravenous cocaine tube here and an optogenetic protection tube here, and they can poke in and make their choice and get the rewards either paired with laser or not. But what are the results? This is the group of rats that had laser paired with sugar, but not with cocaine. So they can earn laser plus sugar pellets or intravenous cocaine all by itself. And what happens is they seek only the laser and sugar pellets. They become sugar addicts. They ignore intravenous cocaine. There's nothing magic about intravenous cocaine when it's pitted against sugar with this amygdala activation. The sugar becomes the addictive target. For the other group of rats who had the laser on cocaine, they become cocaine addicts and they ignore sugar. They don't pursue the sugar. Ordinary rats, control rats, who have the lasers but who do not have channel rhodopsin in their amygdala, they have an inert virus that has no photoreceptors, um, they choose equally. A little sugar, a little cocaine, why not? They're both available, why not take both? It's not the cocaine or the sugar that makes the addictive feature, it's the transformation in the brain that makes this rat a sugar addict and this rat a cocaine addict willing to pursue these things. Is it that the laser makes these things liked more? Does the laser make them like the cocaine more? Does it make them like the sugar more? Does it make them like a shock rod that would ordinarily not be liked? I think the answer is no to that. I don't think the laser is turning on liking. It's hard for us to say that to know for sure for the cocaine and the shock rod, but it's possible to ask and get an answer for sugar because for sugar, we can use the taste reactivity test, the affective facial reaction test of liking that's based upon the way human parents ask their children, newborns, do you like the taste of food we eat? Let's see this again. We're gonna see a newborn human infant who got a taste of sugar water. This is a facial expression to sugar water just before, sort of relaxed face and licking of the tongue. This is a rat who's getting a sugar water infusion painlessly through oral cannula. We're seeing it from the bottom and we slow it down so you can see the rat sort of licks its lips. This is how it reacts to sugar. It likes the sugar. This is bitterness. Bitterness, very different face. Scrinching of the eyes and nose and this sort of gape, triangular mouth gaping to the bitterness on the first day of life. This is a rat getting bitterness. It can't scrunch its eyes and nose. It doesn't have the facial musculature for that, but it can gape, can shake its head, shake its forelimbs, rub its chin on the ground, do those things. Liking for sweetness, disgust for bitterness. It's not the sweetness versus bitterness per se, it's the liking versus disgust. If we took a sweet taste and paired it with nausea three times to create a learned taste aversion, the sweet taste would elicit gapes like the bitterness does. And we can take nasty things and convert them to like things also. So the question is, does the laser increase the liking reactions? If we, if we take a rat and we give it a choice between sugar with the laser or sugar alone, what happens is the rat prefers, seeks only the sugar with the laser, it ignores the sugar alone. So maybe it likes the sugar more, does it? Well, in the taste reactivity test, we'll put the rat in the taste reactivity chamber, give it an infusion of sugar into its mouth, give it the laser on or off and see what that does to liking. And this is the liking reactions here on this side. The blue bar are, is liking reactions to sugar with the laser present. The white bar is liking reactions to the same sugar without any laser in the same rats. And you can see the individual rats here. And basically there's no enhancement of liking. The laser does not make them like the sugar more and it doesn't change. There's no aversive disgust gapes ever. Um, it's not changing liking, but it's powerfully changing wanting. You might then ask, well, if the laser and dopamine are not changing liking, then what in the brain really does generate liking? And as I mentioned, there are these hedonic hotspots that do it. Um, never dopamine, never dopamine, but they can do it if we put in opioid microinjections, a mu opioid agonist. They can also enhance liking if we put in optogenetic stimulation in at least some of these sites. There's a hotspot in the orbital frontal cortex there's another hedonic hotspot in the insula. There's another in the nucleus accumbens, just the rostral dorsal quadrant of the medial shell of the nucleus accumbens. It's just one quarter of the shell of the nucleus accumbens. It's only one tenth 
of the nucleus accumbens itself, the little hotspot, they are tiny. There's another hedonic hotspot in the ventral pallidum and another in the brainstem. They're all quite tiny, nestled within their larger structures, but they're the only parts of that structure which when stimulated appropriately with opioids, with endocannabinoids, with optogenetics sometimes, never with dopamine, dopamine never works, if they're turned on, they can enhance liking reactions and they can make those liking reactions to their sugar much stronger, doubling them, tripling them, sometimes quadrupling them to the pleasantness of the sugar. So these are hedonic hotspots. When we turn one on by a microinjection or an optogenetic stimulation, it recruits all the others into activation too. So they recruit each other into simultaneous activation to cause intense liking. They are all able to cause intense pleasures. We might wonder what happens if they're taken away? Does pleasure go away? The answer for most of them is no, not quite. These are sufficient for gains of hedonic function, for increases in pleasure, but only one of them seems absolutely crucial for normal pleasure. Only one of them, if it's lesioned, will cause normally nice sweet tastes to be responded to as though they were bitter with disgust gate. Sweetness becomes disgusting after one lesion in the brain and only one lesion in the brain, as far as I know. What lesion in the brain can possibly create niceness into nastiness, create disgust for sweetness? It's the ventral pallidum hotspot. This is the soul site. It's something very important for pleasure generation. Um, we don't fully understand why it's the only site, but it's certainly those who want to understand pleasure, it's a good system to focus on. I said I would finally end with implications for human disorders and addictions, and so let's look at those. Drug addiction was the first target of this incentive sensitization, this wanting versus liking distinction um, with Terry Robinson. It's no accident, perhaps, that as addicted drug users watch drug scenes, not only their mesolimbic system, but their amygdala activates also as they're watching these particular cocaine videos that activate them more than pleasant nature scenes. This is Anna Rose Childress again. The notion for drug addiction is that this active hyperreactivity of the brain, the amygdala and the mesolimbic system is causing intense cue triggered wanting triggered by the drug cues. These can be surprising urges because their intensity can vary. Incentive salience is not purely learnt. It's mediated by the state of the individual at the moment. It can be enhanced, increased, intensified by states of stress or by taking a free drug hit or by brain stimulations that create intense surprising urges and can exacerbate it. It's very different from the notion of reward deficiency or D2 down regulation. Still, I think not many people believe this theory in its first years or even first decades. If we look at citations of the theory, it was first proposed in the early 1990s, and we can see it really wasn't cited very much. It's really only in the last 10 years or so that it's taken off. Why has it become more popular in science in the last 10 years that, and when it wasn't before? Well, the evidence that I've been showing you is, is contributed to it. That's one piece of evidence that helped, I think, sway the community, the scientific community. Also, that helped to sway was perhaps an unfortunate, a diabolical medical accident, a human experiment, a diabolical human experiment that nobody would have intentionally authorized, but was inadvertently performed on many Parkinson's patients about starting 15 years ago when new dopamine medications, new dopamine medications for Parkinson's were developed. The old dopamine medication was L-DOPA, which as many of you know, if you take L-DOPA, it makes neurons in the brain secrete synthesize and secrete natural dopamine, release natural dopamine. L-DOPA makes neurons make natural dopamine. But the new drugs are called direct agonist drugs, and they don't produce natural dopamine. Instead, they're like fake dopamine, artificial dopamine. They're direct agonists that can turn on particular D2 types and D3 types of dopamine receptors. So they don't turn on all receptors. They turn on some receptors very intensely. And they help Parkinson's symptoms. So that's very good. But anywhere between 15% of patients up to 46% of patients, depending on which study you read, 
who are taking these direct agonist medications also develop compulsive motivations, basically behavioral addictions. Some of them become compulsive gamblers, even if they've never gambled before. Some of them become compulsive pursuit of sex, por pornography and, and engaging in sex, compulsive shopping. Some develop compulsive eating. Some develop compulsive seeking of their dopamine medications, going to neurologist after neurologist, getting prescriptions and prescriptions for these medications. Even though the medications aren't so pleasant, they become intensely wanted. And a patient who develops one of these addictions, the behavioral addictions, is likely to develop a second or a third, a sort of a family of addictions, all created by dopamine stimulation. What's happening in the brain of those individuals that's creating this addiction? Well, it looks like they're becoming sensitized. Their mesolimbic systems are becoming sensitized. This is a PET study that's looking at dopamine release in the neostriatum, the caudate imputamen, the dorsal striatum, and also in the nucleus accumbens, the ventral striatum. Every one of these patients, blue bars and red bars, every one of these patients is taking a dose of L-DOPA to make them release dopamine. They're all taking the same dose of L-DOPA, and they are all Parkinson's patients, blue and red. So what's the difference? Well, the blue bars are Parkinson's patients who have these behavioral addictions, these compulsions. The red bars are Parkinson's patients taking the same medication who do not have the behavioral addictions. It's clear that those who have the addictions are releasing more dopamine to the same dose of L-DOPA than those who are not. To release more dopamine is to basically become sensitized. That's what rats will do if they're sensitized getting amphetamine again and again. The sensitized dopamine system will release more dopamine after sensitization than it ever released to the same drug at the same dose before. So these authors conclude that their results are consistent with uh, the hypothesis that neural sensitization in these individuals, vulnerable individuals, is causing pathological incentive salience or wanting to be attributed to gambling or to other things. That's artificial stimulation of dopamine systems. How about endogenous spontaneous behavioral addictions? Well, if you had asked me 10 years ago if behavioral addictions were likely to involve dissociations of wanting and liking as drug addiction may, I would have said probably not um, because we knew how drugs could sensitize brain dopamine systems. We knew something about the cellular molecular mechanisms and how would that happen in the absence of drugs? How would it happen spontaneously in individuals? Well, I should have remembered that it has long been known my colleague Terry Robinson here at Michigan showed in the 1990s that it's possible to sensitize rats, mesolimbic dopamine systems, sensitize their dopamine systems without giving them any drugs, simply by a serious stressful experience, undergoing a stressful experience a few times could would cross sensitize. So they'd show a sensitized enhanced dopamine release to drugs the next, if they were ever given the drugs. Sensitization can be induced without drugs. It is possible that in some vulnerable individuals, spontaneous sensitization may be springing up. Is that happening? Well, it's not for me to say, but there are people who are doing neuroimaging studies and finding sensitized hyperreactivity of brain limbic systems to gambling cues in those who are gamblers or to foods, to those who are compulsively eating. So the notion of food addiction has been proposed by some people, um, including my colleague at Michigan, Ashley Gearhart, based upon this kind of hyperreactivity. The notion that some individuals who are showing compulsive sex and pursuit of pornography to the extent that it disturbs even the young men, the individuals themselves, so they seek out a psychiatrist and ask for help. Some individuals are showing limbic hyperreactivity, mesolimbic hyperreactivity to these sex cues as though they were sensitized, leading some authors to suggest there is sex addiction in an insensitive sensitization sense. And others have suggested that in gambling too, this may happen, a sensitization endogenously springing up. Are these correct explanations? I don't know. It's not for me to say. It's for people who are doing neuroimaging, perhaps some of you who would be able to say more clearly, but it's a hypothesis on the table and there is some evidence to support it. The very, very last thing that I should perhaps touch on before stopping is there is a debate in society today and even in science in both 
Europe and the United States, there are criticisms of the notion that um, addiction is a brain disease, that, that addiction is involving brain changes that are somehow making addiction compulsive in a categorical way that's different from ordinary choices. Um, that's been criticized, this notion that addiction is a brain disease. Yeah, although it's meant to reduce the stigma somehow, there are problems with it. So critiques are such that um, many people who are taking drugs and even addicted to drugs may not feel they have a disease. They have a drug problem, but not a disease. Um, the brain systems that are causing wanting, compulsive, sensitized wanting and addiction are the same brain systems that mediate normal wants for food, for loved ones, for other rewards, natural rewards in life. And so um, people like Mark Lewis have written, if addiction is a brain disease, then love is a brain disease because they're activating through the brain, same brain systems. Another critique of the brain a, a disease model is that no one who's addicted is ever cured passively at the hands of a physician or the hands of any clinician. Addiction to escape requires an intense act of personal agency of willpower to give up that compulsion. Um, so it's not a disease in the sense that we, someone can lay hands on us or give us a medication or a treatment and cure us. It requires an act by the patient, by the individual themselves. Of course, there may be some physical diseases too that require people say in diabetes to lose weight or to gain, to do exercise in order to control their symptoms that require active agency. Another critique is that addicts, if they do escape addiction, they may not feel cured. They may not feel the way they were before developing the addiction, but rather in a third state, a state that leaves them constantly vulnerable, that they have to monitor constantly um, in order to not go back to taking drugs again. And that's certainly consistent with incentive sensitization. And lastly, um, a motivating factor is that perhaps funds could be diverted from medical, biomedical neuroscience research to therapy. I think these are legitimate criticisms. Some are more legitimate than others, but, I would say if the incentive sensitization theory is correct in understanding addiction, then what's happening in the brains of these vulnerable individuals, these sensitization changes are pushing the wanting system, the intensity of wanting to an intensity that most of us never face in ordinary life. We all could have super intense wants if we were starved, for example, consistently starved, we would want food much more intensely than we do now or than we ever have. Addiction may be creating a starvation-like want for drugs or the other target that's so intense that it's really beyond the normal range. And it has deleterious consequences. It's something that has to be resisted each time to be successful in full resistance and in avoiding relapse. Um, but that's a probabilistic temptation. Sometimes we're successful. Sometimes we might not be when faced with urges of that intensity. This, I think, may qualify it to be in the realm of some kinds of diseases that also involve parameter changes, not necessarily lesions in our body, but parameter changes that lead to deleterious consequences, like insulin-resistant diabetes is, is an example. There's no lesions to begin with, but there's cells become less sensitive to insulin, blood glucose rises, and that's the disease. It's a parameter change. So this is the nature of addiction as, as we view it. Um, and I hope it's been interesting. I should say I never did any of the work that I've described to you. It's all been done by talented colleagues, graduate students, PhD students, and um, master's students, and undergraduate assistants in the lab who have done all of this work. Thanks for your patience. And if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Now we have to wait a little bit to see if there are questions. There is one uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what is the probability of rats behavior replicating to humans? And second one, can we access? Uh, yeah, no, we cannot access this recording yet. Uh, what is the likelihood that conclusions from the rats experiments do? What is the probability that uh, uh, of the rat behavior to be replicated to, to human? Well, it's always an open question, an empirical question, right? But what I would say is that the distinction between wanting and liking, the notion that dopamine was mediating not liking, 
in the 1980s and 90s when I started, I thought dopamine was pleasure liking. I hoped to find evidence to support it. We couldn't find it in the rats. And we found evidence only that dopamine was mediating wanting. For 10 years after that, no one believed us really. A few people did, but most of the field didn't. And some people would say, well, maybe in rats, dopamine is wanting, but in humans, we know dopamine is liking. 10 years later, people like Marco Layton started to do the dopamine experiments where you suppress dopamine, but give people cocaine, change their wanting, but didn't change their liking. Similarly, Parkinson's patients who have low dopamine when they're not on medication, if you give them tasty ice creams and ask them to rate the pleasure of them, normal pleasure, liking in the absence of dopamine. In the 2000s, the human evidence began to follow and confirm the rat conclusions. This has happened a couple of times. Um, so I think, you know, it's always an open question whether a particular conclusion will transfer from rats to humans, but it has several times. It's just that the human evidence is sometimes slower to accumulate and people have to know what they're looking for. Um, they have to know the, the potential separation of wanting versus liking in order to find it in humans. Finally, that was done. Okay. Uh, from both, we have questions now. Then uh, we would like to thank you so much for your presentation. It was unbelievably uh, important for us. And there is there is one more question in the chat. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Well, yeah. What is the impact uh, of the current findings of desiring things without consciously liking them on our belief on our belief in the free will? I think that's an excellent question also. Um, there is evidence that I haven't talked about that even in humans, ordinary adult humans, it's possible to trigger wanting urges that don't necessarily rise into consciousness. They can, um, but they don't have to. It's as though the consciousness of a want is somewhat separable from the generation of this incentive salience process. It can be translated into consciousness under certain circumstances, but in other circumstances, it might act alone. Um, this is still a controversial issue. It raises it if it's true, it, it has implications for understanding the mind that there can be unconscious emotions and motivations. Um, very different from if we thought there couldn't be. Um, and there may be certain situations where it plays out in behavior too in addictions. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have a question from Thomas Mutan. So uh, go ahead, Thomas. Uh, Thank you. Can you hear me? Because I have had problems with my audio. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for a very fascinating talk. Um, for me, I mean, especially the, the fact that you could actually make the rodents uh, want something that is clearly like unpleasant. That was really, uh, that, that's quite remarkable. And for me, definitely something new. Could that be like a, a hint for something useful? Like uh, there are many, for, for us, for instance, for people, there are many things that uh, we find unpleasant and that can actually like uh, hinder our life. They can be phobia, for instance, or something like that. So could this be like a hint for actually treating some of these symptoms or would it be, would it make like really depressed patients who would actually be become wanting something that they are actually scared of or... <laughs> I think that's a wonderful question and a fascinating issue. And it's sort of a, a great case of will the rat findings transfer to humans, right? I mean, it is. It's, it seems possible to me that this could have applications well beyond addictions to things like perhaps self-harming behaviors where a person dam damages themselves. Usually that's thought to be sort of managing distress and distraction. But um, is it possible that for some it becomes an incentive target, not liked necessarily, but wanted? So similarly, abusive attachments, attachments to abusive caregivers in children, could that happen and recruit this same system? It's an open question. I wouldn't assert that that's happening, but I think it's a possibility, a real possibility, and it deserves your kind of analysis and, and someone to study these kinds of things to see, is it actually happening this way in people? Again, the possibility arises from the animal experiments. Now we have to go and look and see if it's happening in people. There is another question. It's a long one, but um, greeting Professor Berridge. It's a honor to have witnessed your lecture. I would like to ask you uh, if you have read some of the more recent uh, Freeston and colleagues studies involving acting, inter in acting inference theory, 
besides its overall assumption, it specifically refer to belief updating in a Bayesian learning framework. In other words, to belief system for, for formation in humans, religion, political ideas, ethics. Recently, some Christian colleagues, Rigoli Martini, uh, Martinelli Rizzullo in 2021, are proposing computational mechanism of Bayesian learning uh, biased towards motivational aspects, which if impaired can explain some of psychopathological conditions such as delusional disorders. I would like to ask you if you also notice a connection between motivational aspect, uh, wanting, like wanting, and Bayesian learning of abstract concept in humans. Do you, sorry, do you also think that belief formation can be addictive? This is from Michelangelo Tan. I think that's an interesting issue. And the work of Friston and colleagues on Bayesian learning and predictive processing, I think is very, very interesting. Um, can it succeed in, uh, in explaining motivational phenomena? Well, let's let them try. Let's see those explanations and then we can look at them. I do think there are limits to predictive processing and Bayesian learning explanations applied to motivation, such as we've looked at here today. So for example, in the shock rod case, I think um, the rat is predicting accurately that this rod will shock it. And the shock is actually part of what's generating the mesolimbic systems to become attracted to it. It predicts it accurately because it does not get attracted to the dummy rod where it could get the same mesolimbic activation, but not the shock. It only predicts, it only goes. Now, if it does not like the shock and we don't think it's liking the shock, then it has a prediction of an aversive outcome, yet it's positively motivated to this aversive outcome. I'd be fascinated to hear the Bayesian explanation of that. I have never heard one um, so far, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see if there ever is one. Okay. So with this question, we close the first day. Thank you, Professor, again. Thank you for being here. It was an honor for us to welcome you. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to join you and I wish you all luck in the rest of the conference and afterwards. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So for everybody else, see you tomorrow. Uh, we start uh, tomorrow at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, because time, eight uh, uh, wrong time. Uh, it will be a very interesting presentation tomorrow morning. Um, uh, I can only encourage you to come. Uh, Omer Vandenberg will uh, um, will talk about symptoms and the body. Um, he will uh, uh, explain the relations uh, uh, about it. Uh, so, if you are a medical student, if you are a psychologist, you definitely want to to see this presentation. So, until tomorrow, have a great night, and see you. Bye.